I feel really good. I swear that was just awesome. <laughs> and I am going to uh, do something that, I, I, you know, I, I used to hate when preachers would get up and say, I'm going to do something different. Because that always meant it was going to be exactly the same as every Sunday. But I, I think this is actually going to be different. Um, this is what I wrote down in preparation for today. But don't be fooled. Let not your heart be troubled. We will... <laughs> no, let me uh, open this. Can you, can you delete the fact that I'm using technology? I try not to let anybody know that I do that. But I actually am today. Um, I do feel like it's going to be different if for no other reason I'm using technology. But I don't really... Um, I don't want to go any further before I point out something that I think the Lord spoke to me at the beginning. It was actually during the beginning part of worship. I believe it was when you said for us to lift our voices and uh, begin to worship. And the Lord spoke to me and he said this. It's in individual voices forming a choir of worship. And it, what we can what can mess us up as members of a body members of the body of Christ is that sometimes we'll feel lost in the corporate setting we'll feel lost in the fact that there are however many people here today but the entirety of christian life not just when we're lifting our voices together or or whatever it might be but in the entirety of christian life we have to keep in the forefront of our minds that we are an individual that is forming a corporate body together as individuals. The, why is that important? The reason that's important is this. If we begin to get too, if we begin to lean on the fact that there is a corporate body in, the, in, an, in an illegitimate way, we can begin to cease to see that we're powerful individually. What I believe is true of the economy of God's kingdom is that the people are individually supposed to be powerful and then we come together corporately to enjoy the fact that we form the body of Christ. The fact that now, you know, it used to frustrate me. We'd always get together with any church, You'd get together uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, whatever the case may be, we get together and we have this incredible time like we had today. And we hear truth and we pray and we do these things and then we leave and there's something frustrating about leaving. There's something frustrating about going back into the world and, and, um, and having to walk out of this environment. And I began to realize that one of the reasons I was frustrated with it is because all my life indirectly, no, I'm not saying anybody directly promoted this idea. But indirectly all my life, I was taught that this is where the power all is, is in this group all being together, which makes it very hard to be powerful out there. You, or you, there's power here because we're crying out to God corporately. But that, it's, a mis, it's a mistake to believe that now we corporately have to somehow go out and be effective there. The fact is, I've never seen a church that has successfully figured out how to go out corporately as a body and be effective out there. That's one reason why the outreach ideology has been less than fully successful, if I may be generous. The outreach is you. This is a time of saint equipping. We come together as, as you know, there may be a random lost person in here, but I, I doubt it. And the fact is, we shouldn't expect there to be a room full of lost people in here. The, we're the body of Christ, and we come together, and we're excited about the fact that we're the body of Christ, that we can come together and worship a God who we were separated from by sin, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, we can come together as a people, and we can cry out to Him, and we can worship Him as His body. And then when we're in a world where I can't always find David LaPlante when I need him, I have to be able to be strong individually. 
I believe, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'll, I'll put it this way. I believe that one of the great failings of the modern church, particularly the Western church in America, is that we have failed to recognize. Now, we, we've spoken language that would make you think we operate in something that we really don't. We have talked about going out and being the church. I mean, I know I have. We've talked about doing these things. But there is a power that comes when you really begin to get a revelation that you go out as a voice dispatched from Almighty God into a world whose only hope is what you have been given a voice to proclaim. Amen. That's their only hope. Yeah. And if I'm waiting to have a group of 12, a group of 15, or a group of 20 to go out and be effective for God, Spruce Pine will die. Right. Surf City will die. Charlotte will die. The, the world... The hope of the world does not lie in a good outreach. The hope of the world relies on believers who are so walking with God that everywhere they go, they change the environment for the kingdom of God. That's what the hope of the world is. So we are individuals, powerful. And then we have the joy of coming together as the body. We have the joy of knowing that when we are out there by ourselves in a gnarly, sick, disgusting, dark world, that we have the prayer support, the fellowship, the, the backing of this body of people and believers in China. Amen. But we are individually powerful. It's, it's almost a strange coupling with the idea of like the, you know how churches for a long time, and, and some still probably, but churches for a long time kind of flirted with the old covenant again, where the pastor was the guy that really had time to study the word, that's why we pay him, and um, he, you know, he'll come up with some things for us to do, and he'll do this, and he'll do that, and then we have some deacons, and they have to take care of this stuff over here, we have a few other people that take care of that stuff, the rest of us are busy, and, you know, so we just come. That, that's an Old Testament ideology trying to refurbish itself for the new covenant. That grabbed a hold of what I was just talking about and drug it along with it, which is your, your power. If you rob yourself of being, if you rob yourself of being an individual in direct relationship with God every day of your life, you have also robbed yourself of the ability to go out and live that out in public. So, okay. So, that, I don't know that. I hope that wasn't confusing. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, I hope everybody got that. Brendan Argan, uh, Vicki, do you have, or, oh, hi, Raymond. Okay. Um, here I am in Technologyville. God. Okay, hold on. What we're going to do, I'm going to have Brenda come up with me. And this doesn't have anything to do with that, so I'm just goofing off right now. Okay. Come on up, Brenda. What we're going to do is do a proclamation this morning. I love the fact that you uh, opened the ball on that this morning. We're going to do a proclamation we're going to have it up on the screen, hopefully. If not, you know, you, you uh, have your Bible with you, and uh, you can look there. We are going to use the New King James to make this proclamation. And this proclamation is one that's very dear to us. It has, it, it greatly, it greatly has to do with the future, I believe, not only for, for Brenda and I or just you, but us corporately, I believe this is, of great consequence. We're going to go to Acts chapter 3. And we're going to do 19, verse 19. Oh, okay. We're going to do verse 19 through 21. And what we'll do as usual, um, I'd like Brendan and I to, to say it first, proclaim it first, and um, then we'd like you to do it with us. We'll probably do it a couple of times. But as usual, being that it's a proclamation, um, in a minute, we're going to ask you to stand, and we're going to proclaim this as the Word of God, powerful in our lives and for the sake of the world around us. Again, I just want to um, 
reiterate how powerful the word is. Um, when you speak it and you speak it and knowing the power, knowing the author of who this book is, knowing that if, uh, according to, I've been listening to some Derek Prince and, uh, you know, he says that if you don't know something and you're, you're reading a book and you go to the author to, you know, to find out what it means. So, and, and so when, when you know the author and you speak this word, and he said, this is my word. It is not, fi- it's, it's, it's true. Every word in this. And if you don't believe that, then why bother? Amen. So it, it's truth. It's power. It's, it's. It stands the test of time. Amen. So as we proclaim this, I just see it as a, a sword going out of my mouth. <laughs> and, it, and it's sharp. And it cuts both between both bone and marrow, spirit and soul. And it discerns the hearts of man. So let's stand up together. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, Brendan, I uh, will uh, do this once. Repent, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. All right, let's do that together. Ready? Proclaim it. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. All right. Let's, let's be seated. Let me just give some, some uh, idea of why that verse in particular is what we did. Brent and I have been confessing this verse and proclaiming this verse as part, and we, I know we've talked a little bit about this before, but as part of some vision that God gave us um, a while back. And we began to proclaim this along with a couple of other key verses. Luke one seventeen is another one. Um, we, we, and of course, Titus. Titus. Yeah, that's right. Titus too. And, um, today what I really want to do is it's going to be sort of like testimony in a way, but it's going to be, um, testimony that goes to a particular place. That's why I don't have much written down. Um, but I was asking God, what an appropriate launching point would be to tell you what I'm going to tell you today. And, and he put this on my heart. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to try to get into why he did, but he did. <clears throat> this is some stuff that I've been writing. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of some stuff that I've been writing down. And I just want you to, uh, you know, if, if it's, I, I'm working on it. So if it's confusing in any way, I apologize. I'm going to try to uh, read it clearly. And I'd like you to just, you know, try to focus in on what I'm saying, as difficult as that might be. But um, I'm going to begin with a quote from Exodus 33. And then I'll go into what the, the stuff that I've been uh, writing down. <clears throat> Now, therefore, this is Exodus 33, 13. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I might find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. It is time again for the people of God to ask that he consider that this nation is his people not meaning the United States or Israel or any other politically or culturally separated peoples, but Christians, those called out to be separated unto the Lord. Moses brought this petition before the Lord at one of the most critical moments in all of Israel's history. 
Moses had just returned from Mount Sinai where the Lord had given him the Ten Commandments and various other laws concerning appropriate conduct for a people called according to his name. In Moses' absence, however, the people of Israel had grown weary of waiting for his return and had pressed Aaron to create an idol for them to worship. Aaron had obliged, instructing them to bring their gold jewelry to him. He'd fashioned the gold into the form of a calf built an altar before it, and proclaimed a feast to be held the following day. The next morning, the people had gathered together and celebrated their newfound source of comfort, hope, and fulfillment, an idol formed by the hands of men from the resources of men through the abilities of men. Today, the American church stands in an eerily similar situation. We've grown weary of waiting for the return of our Redeemer. We have allowed our impatience to evolve into full-blown disbelief and rebellion. We have pressed our leaders to provide us with a more feasible alternative to the antiquated idea of a soon-returning king. Now we worship before golden calves of our own, but all the while refusing to face the fact that we are engaged in essentially the same act of idolatry as were the Israelites so long ago at Sinai. The calf that was constructed by Aaron for the Israelites was a three-dimensional figure, an object that could be touched and seen, moved about and handled by men. God, on the other hand, is spirit and cannot be represented by any idol. He is supreme in every way and cannot be manipulated. But remarkably, listen, remarkably, neither Aaron nor the Israelites gave their idolatrous golden calf a name of its own, nor did they proclaim it to be a new God. This is from Exodus 32. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. The word Lord right there is four capital letters. Capital L, L capital O, capital R, capital D. That word is translated Yahweh. That's Yahweh God. Okay, Here we see the covenant name of the one true God, Yahweh, being used by Aaron in reference to the calf. This shows that it was not a new and different God that Israel intended to create. They'd witnessed the undeniable miracles, the plagues on Egypt, the bizarre favor shown them by the Egyptians as they prepared for their exodus, the dramatic parting of the Red Sea, They'd been supernaturally sustained by the Lord's provision of fresh water and manna from heaven in the wilderness. They'd even enjoyed their first God-given victory in battle against the Amalekites. In their minds, the making of the golden calf did not constitute abandonment of God. That's important. In the minds of the Israelites, they were not abandoning God when they made this, this golden calf. Okay? In their minds, the making of the golden calf did not constitute abandonment of God. The Israelites were merely trying to associate an earthly, man-made form with an incomprehensible, invisible God to manage the unmanageable and contain the uncontainable. They'd been surrounded by the world, becoming familiar with it and dependent upon it for a long time before finally becoming acquainted with the miraculous acts of the God of their fathers. When he did reveal himself to them, it was in order for them to become his special treasure, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But upon his self-revelation, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said, this is from Exodus again, then they said to Moses, you speak to us. And we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear. God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off. But Moses drew near through the thick darkness where God was. Moses drew near and sought the reality of God even through the thick darkness of incomprehensibility. The people, on the other hand, chose to deal with God only from a distance. Therefore, they lacked revelation of him. Listen, they would not draw near 
but they stood afar off. The people, on the other hand, then uh, from a distance, therefore lacked revelation of him as he truly is and inevitably produced an idolatrous image according to their own ideas and desires concerning him. Does that make sense? They never drew near to him, so they eventually made something that they were familiar with, something that they could handle and manipulate and control and just called it him. Okay? Herein we find the previously mentioned similarity between the Israelites of Moses' day and the Western church and our own. Though, un listen, though unwilling to admit that the God we have come to serve is no longer the biblical God, we are all the while standing afar off from him and fabricating our own idol with which we can feel comfortable and familiar, one over which we can maintain control. We fashion it according to the likeness of things we see in our ungodly culture around us. We construct it using worldly materials of earthly value. Then with arrogant satisfaction, we erect our altars around our golden calf and hold our feasts before it. We even turn to the unsaved people of the world around us, point at our golden calf and urge them to fall down before it as well. And so we stand on the same slippery slope as did our ancient ancestors before us, desperately needing to offer up a prayer of remembrance to our God, asking that he consider that we are his people, renew our clarity, and stir our hearts to repent and rediscover his true self-disclosed identity. Moses asked that the Lord show him his way. This, let me just read, this is the English translation of a Hebrew word, direct. The word direct means a course of life or a mode of action. What Moses sought was an intimate knowledge of the Lord, to know his manner, to know his nature, the way by which he operates. This denotes a level of intimacy that goes beyond a mere awareness of what God says or what God may do. Anyone present for an act of God may have the capacity to observe what happens on the surface. It is something else entirely for a man to know God with true intimacy and thus be able to discern the divine thought behind his actions. King David later confirms that God had made known his ways to Moses, but his acts to the children of Israel. Here David uses the same word, direct, to describe the depth of Moses' knowledge of God as opposed to the relatively shallow knowledge held by the people. And so the Israelites did not hear the word of their God, but only perceived the naturally observable effects of his presence, the sound of thunder, the flashes of lightning, and so on. This decision of Israel's to keep a distance from God had far-reaching effects. Centuries later, when Jesus was nearing the time of his crucifixion, the Father again spoke from heaven with strikingly similar results from the people. Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. These are the Israelites again. They said that it had thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Now that Jesus has come and by his blood secured a new and better covenant, the opportunity to confidently approach God and intimately know, know him has been restored to mankind. Yet many who would call themselves his people. I want, I want you to listen to this with understanding that, I, you know, I'm, I only talk this way because I love the church. I love the church. And I want to see the church glorious, set apart to God. I, I, I believe that's what God wants to see, and that's why it's dear to me. Many who would call themselves his people today still keep at a distance from him, standing in the shadows of self-deception instead of dwelling under the shadow of his mighty hand. They claim to have allegiance to Jesus Christ, while in reality they only cleave to a golden calf to which they have simply attached his name. 
Instead of taking advantage of their God-given opportunity to study and meditate on his word, they pushed the Bible aside and willingly opened themselves up to ideas, philosophies, and theories of a culture that stands in blatant contradiction to the teachings of Scripture. Instead of seeking the heart of God in prayer and fasting, they indulge in the worship of, of self in temples of social media, and they pollute themselves with a steady diet of humanism at the banquet table of the world system. What is the golden calf of the modern American church? Put simply, it is a man-made image falsely referred to as Christ that will conform to the whims of its worshipers. Amen. That, the, and obviously because I wrote that, but that to me is the singular greatest issue the Western church has today. That's, that's, that's it. Now, let me, let me show you why. Now, okay, I'll show you the blatant ones. Here, here are the blatant ones that are just in your face. We have entire denominations that are beginning to embrace an ideology of Unitarianism where Jesus works. Now, now listen, I'm not talking about some group of politically motivated people out there. I'm talking about people that call themselves the church, Jesus Christ Church. And they will tell you that Jesus is good, but these other people that are going by another route, well, who are we to judge? Who are we to say that they're wrong? Unitarianism. Let me tell you something. That is a golden calf. You cannot say that Jesus is not the only way and still be a Christian. And so you're worshiping a golden calf. There are entire denominations marrying homosexuals at their altars. When the word of God is so clear that that is absolutely forbidden, is considered depravity and sin in every way, and yet we have entire denominations that have embraced that ideology. That's a golden calf. Now, I'm not saying these people, not, I'm sure there's some people in these churches that are saved, but, it, but their stomach has got to be turning. If they know the real God that's a golden calf. And we refuse to admit, you know what? Go do your own religion. Man, if you want to get, if you want to, if you, you know, if you want to do all this crazy stuff that the Bible forbids and you want to teach other people to do it, for God's sakes, form a cult and go get some people to follow you and then teach them whatever you want. But if you attach the name of Christ to it, you just said that it's going to have the nature of Christ. That's what the word Christianity is supposed to mean. It has the nature of Christ. And the nature of Christ is to do the will of his Father. And the will of his Father is the irrefutable word of Almighty God, which forbids Unitarianism, which forbids homosexuality. And yet, the church is in, in, just in wild number, giving in. You know what Rob Bell said? Who knows who Rob Bell is? Let me tell you what that joker said. Now, this is somebody that was a youth pastor for years and did some other things. I'm not sure what all he did in the church. But recently, I watched... Now, now, the, okay, I could probably stop after saying that this guy is Oprah's spiritual leader. But beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, right? <laughs> How would you like to be Oprah's spiritual leader? Wouldn't that be cool to have, have that on your resume? <laughs> oh, no, Oprah. Amen. Yeah, Amen. <laughs> So Rob Bell said this, Oprah was interviewing him, and she said, so how far off is the mainstream church from fully embracing homosexuality? Rob Bell said, we're a breath away. He said, we're a breath away. And it's funny that he used the word that is the translation of the spirit, the, a breath away. Then he said this, she, I guess she pressed him on it. I can't remember exactly what she said after that, but this is, was his, his response. He said, well, how in the world can we live with ourselves looking at hurting people standing right in front of us and letting a 2,000-year-old letter interfere with us embracing another person? Now, I'll be straight with you. I can see how that works. I can see how that works with people. But you know why? Because our big golden calf that sits in our church sanctuaries that we fall down before, 
generally is a golden calf of humanism. That 2,000-year-old letter is more important than every life in this room. Corporately. It would be better... Listen, men have died for centuries, pulled apart by horses, burned at the stake, so that they could preserve the Word of God. There's some people who had some revelation. Amen, that's right. The Word that comes from the mouth of God is more valuable than all of human life. That's right. All of human life. Let me say this, and I said this to a couple of guys yesterday. Consider this. God has never let go of His holiness for the sake of human life. But He has historically constantly done away with human life to preserve his holiness. Think about that. God has never let go of holiness for the sake of human life, but he will destroy an entire culture to preserve his holiness. And I'll, I'll go a step further. Why did he destroy entire cultures in the Old Testament? Not just to protect his own integrity, but that was to protect the integrity of his people. God's priority is God. Now, there's, there's one that's not going to get you far in social media, but it's true. God is, did not become a humanist just because he created Adam. When he created Adam, he knew that it was for Adam's benefit that he, he created Adam so that Adam might be able to enjoy the glory that it is to be in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. Without God, this life isn't worth living. So, so, mm, so the, the, I guess what you could say is the burning call that I've just felt from the Lord for many years, and it's gone deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, is that I believe that the answer to the depravity of the world is not found in evangelism. It's not found in outreach. It's not found in aggression. It's found in the people of God being totally possessed by their God. That's the answer. I've heard people be so foolish as to say that oh, whatever you're doing as a Christian isn't really worth anything if it's not reaching people. Well, I don't really feel like going up to Brother Lawrence and telling him that his life was a waste. The dude was a monk and wrote a little bitty book that's changed more lives than I'll ever get to have my voice over in my, in, in my entire life. That dude did not waste his life. Seeking God. There are people who don't have the luxury of getting to walk out into society and walk around and be... be aggressive and, and you know, there are people that don't have that luxury are we saying that well their effectiveness is just shot oh well think about think about this if our delusions about reaching people were to be true that would mean that we would all be better off to leave here and move to New York or LA think about it Think about this. If what we believe about reaching people is true, then this church is a struggling, pathetic little band of wannabes, and the big mega church is the real deal because they have a TV show. They have a radio program, and their leader is well-known in three continents. I'm so past all that stuff. That's, that's just, you know what those leaders ought to do is pray that they might increase so that Christ might increase. Did I say right? Decrease so that Christ might increase. But that, that is the, that's become just the driving force in my life. And I want to give you some background today of why that is. Um, when I was young, and when I say why that is, it's because I'm, just, I'm starting to not even say I believe it's true. It's just true. It's just true. And this is how God began to show me in my life that it was true. When I was a kid... I did not grow up in a Christian home. 
My, my parents are great people. Um, they didn't, but they, they, you know, we didn't talk about God. We didn't do any of that stuff. Uh, we would go to church every now and then, but, you know, that was usually just because it was a singing engagement and me and my family sang, so, you know, we'd go and do that. Well, one of the ways in which we sang together is that we would gather around in the living room and Dad would break out a hymn book um, that he had got from his mom. It was like one of those old gospel hymn books with the little shape notes. And we'd, we'd sing those because if you're going to sing four-part harmony, then there's no better choice than to break out a hymn book. That's the only reason we did it. So we break out this hymn book. We had done this many times. But this one particular night, I would say I was probably 10 or 12 years old, somewhere in that area. We gathered in the living room. We broke out the little song books. We turned to a song called, Oh, Sacred Head Now Wounded. Do you recognize that song? Oh, sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down. Now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. You ever heard that song? Awesome, awesome hymn. So here I was at 10, 11, 12-year-old boy. We sit down. We begin to sing this song as a family. We get through about half of the first verse, and I burst into tears. And I ran out of the room because I was so embarrassed, and I went to the bathroom. And I was like, oh, my God, what's going on? You know, I, I didn't know what was happening. I thought, I'm nuts. So I dried my eyes, you know, got all composed. Came back out in the living room. My sister's sitting there looking at me like, <laughs> stupid. And uh, my parents were like, what is going on with the boy? Let's try it again. So we, we start the song again. We might get four words into that song, buddy. I burst into tears again. Ran out of the room again. And um, stood in the bathroom going, my God, what's going on? And um, I stood there and, and tried to compose myself. We might have tried it one more time with the same result. So finally, my parents were just like, forget it. You know, let's move on to something else. And so at that early stage, if I had heard the gospel, it was barely through one tiny hair way back in the back of my ear somewhere. I had not heard. I hadn't heard the gospel, really. I'd sat in churches and played with cards and and drawing things. I didn't, know the, I didn't know the gospel. But man, God came in through a song that isn't exactly a straightforward song. Go look at the words of that song sometime. It's not, it's not you know, this is not, this is not kid lyrics. But man, that thing messed me up. And years go by. You know, nothing else happened. That was it. That was it. And I, I went on with life. And as time went by, I began to just be, a, you know, high school uh, idiot, and I began to do my own thing, and um, I became a, you know, a drinker, drug user, all that stuff. I was doing all that stuff. Fl ver basically flunked out of high school. I, I, at that point, I don't know what Mountain Heritage is like now, but at that point, Mountain Heritage was such that they would give you a little help, if, you know, so that you wouldn't embarrass yourself. They let me walk across the stage and then made me go to summer school afterwards so that I could get my diploma. But uh, I did get my diploma. But then after that, I went and just tried all kinds of different things. I joined the Army. I, um, I w traveled. When I went to California, did all these different things. And um, when I went out to California, we were, you know, there was a lot of drugs, doing a lot of that stuff. And out in California, there's a high cost of living. And, of course, drugs are expensive basically everywhere. And so, you know, me and my buddies began to struggle. So uh, we started doing burglaries. We'd go up into the hills and where you have the red clay hills and the tumbleweed-looking area, you know. There'd be campers um, just sitting out there. There was like no road or anything. You know, these guys would just go up in there in their Jeeps, and they lived in these little campers. So uh, we broke into these campers, and we would go to the swap meet, and we'd go and we'd get rid of all this stolen property. And so I was doing that. Um, one day I was driving down the road. I had a, a car trunk full of stolen guns, and I was speeding. I was exceeding the speed of sound, and I get pulled over. And because I was, in, I don't know, it may be this way here now, I don't know, but in California at that time, if you were doing so much above the speed limit, they instantly search your car. So they searched my car, and, um, of course, it was full of stolen guns and ammunition. And um, they... Uh, and I was also drinking, so there's another charge that I got. And um, so they take me to jail, directly to jail. And um, what did I not pass? 
Thank you. So I, I go to jail, and while I'm, while I'm sitting there in jail, I'm just counting the moments because I know that in about, um, I don't know, 72 hours. See, they only had me on possession of stolen property. That's a misdemeanor. So I knew in about 72 hours I'd get to leave. And uh, so I wasn't saying nothing, you know, and all the stuff. I knew they were out there doing some investigating, but what I would have said at the time was, thankfully, they did not. Oh, okay. <laughs> they did not find anything more to put on me. So I leave. They let me out. They OR me. I left on my own reconnaissance. And I leave, and I immediately I, went, I came back to North Carolina. So I moved to North Carolina. I'm in North Carolina just kind of, you know, I don't know, doing the same sort of thing. A um, few other things happened in there that I'll just skip. But eventually I ended up here. And I went to, I started going to Mayland Community College, still just partying with the people and everything and, you know, doing that sort of thing. But um, I met a girl while I was there, a girl named Tyra. We started dating. Um, and eventually Tyra became pregnant. So we decided that we would do the right thing and we'd move in together. So we move in together um, up in Newland. So we're living up there together. She, we, we, we have a baby. It's a little girl named Mara. And uh, we, you know, are, are just kind of doing the thing. You know, I'm smoking a little pot here and there. But basically, I felt like I was doing a much better job. You know, I was going to work every day, uh, working with a construction company. And... Uh, you know, I felt pretty good about things. Well, about the time Mara was about three months old, I get up one morning and, uh, to go to work, and I pull the covers up. You know, she slipped there in between us. So I pull the covers up, and I get ready, and I go to work. Well, several hours later, I'm on a roof, and I'm, um, uh, we're putting on the, uh, the uh, felt paper on this roof, and a police officer pulls into the work site, and he asks me to come down. So I go down and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, boy, California, here I come, you know. So I go down and I, I look at the guy and he says, get in the car, you know. So I get in the front of the car with him and I'm thinking, this is kind of surreal. And uh, so we're driving down the road and I'm saying, what's going on? And uh, he said, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, he was acting funny and I thought something, something strange is going on here. Well, Finally, he says, we're going to the hospital. We, we pull into the hospital, pull up in the emergency room circle of the hospital, and Tyra was sitting there on the, on the uh, sidewalk, had her head in her hands, and, you know, immediately I knew what was going on. And so uh, Mara had passed away. She had uh, sudden infant death syndrome and died at three months. And uh, so it was kind of a strange following several days. I don't really have a good memory of it, to be honest, but um, I guess we just hung out. I, I don't know what we did, but we sat around in that apartment or whatever. And eventually, uh, we have a funeral. We have the burial. And then some police officers approached me, and they said, we'd like to talk to you a little bit. You know, we do, a, we do an investigation whenever there's an infant death, and we'd like to talk to you a little bit about some things. I said, okay. So I went down to the police station. We walked into an office, and all these, all these detectives were standing there. And we walk in. They close the door behind us. And uh, one of them looks at me and says, have you ever been to California? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, well, we were in your apartment doing our investigation. And we found an expired California driver's license in your stuff, and we decided we'd run it. And he said, you're wanted for multiple felonies in California. Were you aware of that? And I said, yeah. You know, I mean, oh, I was just, what do you, you know, it was over. And so I, I said, yeah. So they arrest me and different things happen. I end up getting extradited back to California and I go to jail. Now, here's where things get really interesting. When I get to California, now they had what, what they, they have, over, well, they had, I guess they still do. They had overcrowding issues you would not believe in the prisons in California. And I was actually housed in a building that had been a jail, but they had converted it into a prison. Now, the weird upshot of that is that you're in prison, but you don't, 
you don't get to roam around. I mean, it's like you're in prison with jail rules. Awful. And I was in there with people that had huge sentences. I was like, this is bizarre. One of those guys was a guy named Harvey. Harvey was a thug. This guy was as bad as it get. He had, he was a, if you wanted to get somebody to play an, uh, as an actor, to play the big felon evil dude in your movie, that dude is a guy you would hunt down and get to be in your movie. Perfect. And Harvey, come on, his name was Harvey. It's like, you know, so anyway, no offense any Harveys in here, but come on. So anyway, Harvey was in there. Now, Harvey was this big, just, you know, he weighed more from here up than the rest of his body all put together, just this monster guy. He had his head shaved and tattoos all over his head. Just, just talk like this all the time. This is the only tone he had. This is how he talked to everybody. And it was just, you know, you just dread seeing the dude coming. I never had any personal issues with him, thank God. But he was a rough character. Now, here's what's neat about, about Harvey. There was a man in there who Harvey treated differently than everybody else there. And I began to notice it and, and, and began to pay attention to this guy that Harvey treated differently than anybody else there. And this guy's name was Frank Rodriguez. And he, he, was, a, he was a Mexican guy. He was pretty, t pretty tall, really. Um, didn't really speak very good English at all. But Harvey would act different around him than he did other people. And I began to notice that other people acted differently around Frank Rodriguez than anybody else. And I thought, man, and, and I'll tell you some other things. Frank Rodriguez was the kind of guy that carried himself... Um, I remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer said when he was locked up, right before they hung him because of, you know, dealing with the Nazis and all that, right before they hung Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the things he said was that when he came out of his cell, people looked at him like he was a squire coming from his country house. That's because of the presence of God on his life. Well, that's the way Frank Rodriguez was. Just, just different. I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to cheapen it by trying to tell you why, but it was different. The guy was just different. Couldn't even understand what the dude was saying. Just different. One day, they voted on the three strikes law in California while he was there. Now, Frank had about a seven-year sentence, but it had been his third offense, and then he had gotten saved. Well, because it was his third felony, the three strikes law was going to directly apply to him. He found out that he was not doing seven years. He found out he's 55 years old. He found out he was going to do 25 to life watching television. That's how he found out. He saw it on the news that he was going to do 25 to life. Let me tell you what happened. I'm not saying this. Well, I'm not, I don't want to talk about the justice in that. But that's what happened. And this, this is what happened with Frank. Frank got an unlock. Remember I told you we were in a jail kind of facility? So we could go into a cell and get lock, we could do, have a lockup. If I just want to stay in my cell all day, I could go in there and have a lockup. So Frank asks for an unlock. He goes into his cell, and they close the door behind him. Now, I'm telling you, people in main population were wondering what he was going to do to himself. That was the conversation. Was, well, I wonder what Frank's going to do. Talking about suicide. Or maybe, I don't know, a hospital visit so he could maybe br try to break free or something. Well, he was in there for a probably, I think he was in there maybe a day and a half, he gets an unlock. He walks out. I swear it was like a squire coming from his country house. That dude walked out of there, and he was the same guy that he was when he walked in. And I remember at that moment, I said to myself, I don't know what this guy's doing, but I'm doing my time just like him. And I began to study this guy's actions and try to really figure him out. And he didn't speak English, so it's not like I could really go talk to him because he didn't have much to say. To, in my language, and so I just had to watch. Now listen, as a confirmed atheist, you can imagine my disappointment when I realized he was reading a Bible and praying. I, at first, I decided that couldn't be it. I was like, that no, can't be it. That's just a coincidence. That couldn't be what the difference is. Because I'd, I'd never seen it make a difference before, and so I didn't believe that it could be making a difference in him, in his situation. 
a man in his position. But I began to realize that that's what it was. And I, for the first time in my life, I began to understand what it was that the Lord was beginning to prick my heart with as a 12-year-old boy singing a song, that there's a sacred head that was wounded, that paid the price. I began to see it. This, is, this, may, sound, this may sound like a bit of a stretch when I say this, but I, I began to understand the gospel because of a man that could not tell me the gospel. And I mean, I, I know there were little seeds. I know, I know. I know I'd heard some people talk before. I'd been to a church service before. I know that's true. But I'm telling you, I doodled on paper. Now, I may, I'm sure that some stuff got in there. I'm not saying it didn't. But mostly, this is my story. My story is that God invaded a household that did not honor him, came into the, the heart of a little boy and said, I'm real, I'm here, and I'm not going away. And then he withdrew himself for 12 years. He withdrew. And I did my thing. And then at the appointed time, there was a man there who could not communicate the gospel to me with his mouth that lived his life in such a way that God became undeniable. That, listen, if there's one thing that will shape a believer's life, it's the nature of his conversion. And I'm telling you, I was marked by that for the rest of my life. I began to notice when I would hear people talk about the certain way that you had to do it in order to be saved, that you had to be in a church and you had to come to the altar and a particular person had to come and pray with you, you had to go down the Romans road, you had to confess certain things, say certain things, say certain things about Jesus, say certain things about yourself, and then after they pray for you, after that, now you're saved. Well, then I'm lost. That none of that ever happened to me, none of it. None of it. I walked out of that prison and I stepped out onto that street. And I'm telling you what, if I'd been hit by a bus in that moment, I would have immediately been in the presence of Jesus Christ. I know it to be true. I know it to be true. I had never been taken to a corner and prayed with in a corner of that prison. Never. I had never sat down and read the Bible. Never. But I believed, and if you read this book, you'll find that it's those who believe that God comes and does radical things in their life, whether it be salvation or whatever comes next. Amen. It's those who believe. So I come back to North Carolina and kind of at a loss. You know, it's like I had some inklings of what I might ought to do next, you know. But most of it was, you know, most of it was very natural things. I, I, you know, I was thinking about how am I going to eat, you know, chiefly. And um, so I came back to North Carolina, got, um, got some help. I, I actually walked to work, the Times Square Diner. Anybody know where the Times Square Diner is? I walked to the Times Square Diner from a little apartment I got and worked there and um, met Brenda there. A guy was back there, assistant cook, and I was cooking, and he said, there's a woman that comes in here and cooks, or comes in here and, well, she's cooking, but she comes in here and waits tables. That's what she does. And he said, she comes in here and, and waits tables. What are you all thinking right now? Man. Jeez. We have to have prayer before we can continue. But so anyway... <laughs> Okay, anyway, so, so anyway, she's going to come into white tables. And um, this is why I don't let Brenda interrupt me while I'm, while I'm preaching. You know, you, I would love for her to come up and do this with me, but I'm afraid she'd fix things like that, and they're better left unfixed. So, um, but anyway, so I was the cook. She came in. She started waiting tables. But this guy told me the first night she was going to come, he said, Brenda's coming to white tables tonight, and he said, you're going to like her. I can just feel it. You're going to like her. And I was like, well, great, you know. Well, she shows up, and um, immediately I, I recognize that she's beautiful. You know, I, I saw that right off the bat. But then we were, we were there 
Um, I was I was cooking, and the first order she got, you know, now, and I'm not. This is nothing against the other waitresses, but they would come up and they would, you know, they'd put the little ticket up in the window and go, "Here you go," and walk off. You know, "Here you go," and walk off. Brenda came up and she took that ticket. And she slammed that ticket down on the, on the window. Bam! And she went, "Order it." I turned around and walked off. I looked at that guy. I swear, this is the truth. As sure as I'm standing, I looked at that dude and I said, I'll be married to that woman in one year. That's what I said. And guess what? About a year later, we got married. <laughs> and it's been just great ever since. She still talks to me that way. But, but, uh, but I, try to, I try to, you know... Um, I try to, you know, just be good to her and do what I'm supposed to do. And eventually one day we're hanging out and she said, um, I think we had mentioned the, the Lord a little bit, but it was real weird. Yeah, Brenda said, are you going to go to church with me? And um, yeah, I said, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> she was hot, you know, for one thing, but I knew that I was supposed to do that. I thought, well, I was supposed to do that. So so sure, you know, so we went, we went to a little church, awesome little church. That's where, uh, Courtney, who, uh, has received more abuse at my hands in her life than she deserves. But anyway, I'm glad they're here. This is her husband. His name is Michael. Awesome guy. But, uh, um, anyway, that's our, that's her niece. And, uh, but anyway, so we started going to this church and that's where Courtney went and, uh, some of uh, some other family of Brenda's, and we started going, and man, we learned about the cross. We began to learn about um, who the Lord is. Um, but there came a point at which we knew we needed to change. We needed to. There was some. There was a. There was something in us that was driving that would not let go of us. It felt a lot like frustration. Um, but finally, the Lord began to move. I was working at a lumber yard, Henson Building Materials, for those of you who are Avery County familiar, and um, Hugh Hall, huh? Hugh Hall, huh? Hugh Hall walked up to me one day, and he squeezed the life out of me on that lumber yard, and he said, you've got to come and do something. You've got to be a part of something. And I was like, okay. And he said... Come down to Spruce Pine tonight. You gotta come and be a part of this. It's just gonna be awesome. So we came down to the executive center. I think I went by myself that first night. Yeah, it was the Rock Church. Had it was Chris and Delano were had they just come, and it was at the uh, executive center. And so we went into that thing. Now let me tell you, we had been in a great church. No, I don't want to hear you to hear me wrong. Great church. But it was very old-fashioned, you know. We sang the, the first and last verse of three hymns and, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, I'm, not, I'm not, trust me, I, I'm not hung up on style. I, that's fine. But what was missing, well, let me just say that. We walked into the back of that church, or the back of the executive suite center, whatever it is. We walked in there, and we went, and we stood near the back. And I'll never forget, uh, Worth Crow was right here. And there were some other people, and we stood there. And I remember Brenda got a hold of my arm and pulled on my arm, and I leaned down, and she said, with, with that shake in her voice, she said, look at how they worship God. And we knew that there were, we were about to see what we'd been missing. We were about to discover what it was. Now, to make a long story short, we learned that there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit we learned that, there is, that you can become baptized, immersed in the spirit of Almighty God. That you didn't just have to try to learn this book and then behave accordingly. But you could be absolutely immersed in the very spirit of the Son, Jesus Christ. Man, from there, from there on, boom. You talk about a chain. I'm not talking about everything was roses and, and gardens and glorious and all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. But we can look back now. There were a lot of hard times after that. But we can look back now and we can see that after that moment, things just started to happen. They, we, began to, we began to receive words. 
We do get a word in prayer, or we get a word from somebody else, a prophet. I remember one time we were at a we were at a conference, and Lou Engel. You know who Lou Engel is? Lou Engel. We were there with with I don't know how many thousand people. We were there, and we were worshiping, and all of a sudden I felt this hand on my chest, like that. I opened my eyes, and Lou Engel's right here, and he had his hand on my chest, and he was doing this number like this, and he goes, "The fire of Elijah is on you." To turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and sons to fathers. And turn and walked off. I was going, my God, what was that? And so, but, but here's the cool thing. I think it was in that same conference that Damon, who ended up being my spiritual father, said this from the platform. He said that we've misinterpreted the, the law and the prophets prophesied until John, but now, uh, oh God, can you quote that for me, Bill? The law the, the, the prophets prophesied until John. We have interpreted that to mean that, the, that prophecy ceased when John showed up. This is what he said. He said, this is what that verse means when you actually translate it and look at the Greek. That means that up until John, the prophets and the law prophesied. But now there's a time at which you take it. What does it say? The kingdom of God has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. And he began to say, when, well, here's the mistake we've made. We've let somebody say, you're going to get a new job this year. Thus saith the Lord. So we go home and we say, buddy, I better get a job this year or that joker's a false prophet. That's what we've done. Instead of saying, now I have to press into that word. In the, in the Old Testament, prophecy was highly predictive. And, and warning. It was uh, prophecy mostly did predictions and warnings. Now, there are some, you know, not always, but mostly. That's not the case in the New Covenant at all. It, what, in the New Covenant, a prophecy is given so that you can see what's available and then be violent enough to take it by force. You have the guarantee of the word as long as you press rightly into the word. Now, this is what happened. When I heard that from my spiritual father and then realized that Lou Engel had just told me I'm not blah, 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 blah about Elijah, I was like, I'll take it. I know that dude's the real deal. I know he's a real prophet. I recognize him as such. He just said that to me. There's no mistaking who he was talking to, and I'm going to take it. I took hold of that immediately, but things began to happen. We began to find ourselves generationally minded. We began to think of, to, I began to, I'll give you, I was at a church where there was an old man there, and this guy from the pulpit, this, uh, the pastor from the pulpit said, Happy birthday to whoever, this man, he's sitting back here. He's going to turn 101 or something. This guy's going to turn 101 years old today, and we just thank him for his, his walk with God. When he said that, something came over me that goes directly back to that word that was prophesied over me and, what, and all of that. And, and this thing came over me. And let me tell you, I couldn't wait for that preacher to hush so that I could go back there and get with that old man. And man, as soon as the amen was spoken at the end of that service, I went straight back there to that man. And I said, when did you get saved? And he said, I think he said he was 13. And I said, I want a man who's walked with God for 90 years to bless me. And this saint who, has, who was walking with God during the First and Second World Wars, I want that dude praying for me. And he prayed over me. This old, he could barely stand up. He got, he got up slowly with his walker, and he was standing there. And, man, he got a hold of me, and he went, Son, I just say that the Spirit of all my... I was going... Oh. It was unbelievable. The man prophesied over me and blessed me. Whew, that's where it's at, man. That's where it's at. We started caring about kids. We started looking at young people, and we began to realize that that was the seed. You can take everything. The Lord showed me this. You can go back and look at everything that, that the Bible promises that we're not seeing happen today and immediately attribute it to fathers not raising up sons. Every one of them. We began to realize these things, and God began to move. Now, let me fast forward. I don't even know what time it is, and I apologize, because I'm sure it's too late. Anyway, I, I, again, I can't tell. I don't even know. Is there a clock on a computer? 
So anyway, so, okay. So, okay, let me say this real quick and we're done. So this is the, this is the, the practical outcome of everything that I've told you. The Lord for years, since the very beginning, for me, has been showing me that there are methods and programs that have been adopted by the church with good intentions, but they're robbing the church of the ability to actually operate in authentic relationship with God and therefore be authentic out there, to be authentic with each other, and to enjoy an authentic conversation with the Holy Spirit, which is God. We have the opportunity to walk with God. Jesus Christ came and did what he did so that we could walk with Almighty God. And we have let ourselves become a part of something that looks at it as a group activity where we come together on similar ideologies and we agree on certain beliefs and so we gather together based on those beliefs and then we do things in accordance with what we believe. Well, that all sounds well and fine. It's probably a good description of, it's probably a good definition of the word religion. But at the end of the day, we are not actually enjoying what Jesus really came for us to enjoy. We're, we're, I mean, I'm not. I'm not I'll, I'll put myself right in there. I'm not. I've determined in my heart that I'm going to know the heart of Almighty God. That's the determination of my life, is that I'm going to know His heart. And I, I guess I've just become just so... I'm, I'm just not going to let concern with other things interfere with that. I'm just not going to let building programs interfere with that. I'm not going to let a feeling of guilt because there are people that are going to go to hell. I'm not going to let a feeling of guilt interfere with that. I'm not going to let you got to be busy at your church or you're not really pulling your weight. I'm not going to let that interfere with the fact that Jesus Christ bled and died so that I could walk with God, not be effective, not be aggressive. That's what we, that's what we make Christianity into. In fact, if somebody is quiet and, you know, doesn't really have, you know, not really outgoing, we try to fix them so that they could be a good evangelist. That's ridiculous. The, what Jesus did is open a doorway of relationship between the Father and you, a Father and, and them. And what we as the church can do, and this is what Times of Refreshing is all about. This is what's going what, what's gonna to happen up at Choir Flight. That's what This is what it's about. Is that there is a place in God that the church could go that would make it effective, not because of coercion, not because of good pep talks, not because we've been guilted into doing anything, but because we just walk with God. There's power in that that I'm telling you, it's untapped. It's, it's untapped in most of the American church. The power of walking with God every single day. The one who spoke it all into existence. The one who has the power to do anything he wants. And we can walk with him. So there we go. I just want to pray that we will all have an authentic walk with him. That we will be that individual that is in a deep connection with Almighty God in such a way that we can really become part of a choir. We aren't going to hide behind the other singer beside us because we think they're a better singer than us. But we're going to be the individual that God can, can make us into and is conforming us to his image to be. 
We can be that and then be a powerful choir of people. But first we have to accept the fact that what Jesus did was not activity-based. It wasn't activity-oriented. It's relationship-oriented, and that is what we need to take hold of. So let's pray. God, I just pray, Lord. I thank you, God, for this day, Father, that you have given us. Lord, it is a new year beginning today, and I know I did not mention that. But, Lord, I do believe, God, that you are calling us. Lord, you're calling us, God, to a place of greater relationship with you than we've ever known. And God, we just take hold of that, God, and we say yes and amen. We say yes, God, to what you're calling us to as individuals. God, I thank you, Lord, that every person in this room was created by your hands. Lord, that you have laid out a journey for every person in this room. And that journey that you have laid out, God, is a journey that will bring you the greatest glory. God, it's a journey that will bring them the greatest life they could have. Lord, it's a journey that is going to transcend all the things that we have thought were important in the past. And Lord, it's going to make us just, just a living epistle in the earth. God, we thank you for it, Lord. We embrace it, God. God, I pray over each individual in this room. God, I pray that you would just help us, God, as individuals to step away from the things that we have always associated with you, Lord, that are just traditions of men. And God, that we would embrace the reality of who you are. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's lift our hands just for a moment.